The following podcast is a little fiery but mostly peaceful. If you're an automaton, turn away now and shelter in place. If you're a Catholic ready to renew your prescriptions of red pills and white pills, stay tuned. Hello and welcome to Catholics Aren't Zombies. I'm your host, Chris Munir. Delighted to have you again. So today I'm going to tackle a topic that is going to challenge you on a sacred cow that you might have. Something that you hold almost sacred in American culture. And I'm going to talk about the not-so-greatest generation, the World War II generation. Oh boy, see, I'm going to hear about it now. I might get a few emails on this one. Oh, what's he doing there? Ah, oh, they're they're wonderful. They fought World War II, the World War II generation. They stormed the beaches in Normandy. They's wonderful. How, how can you possibly not love them? Well, okay. First and foremost, and yes, I know people have thought that for a long time, but let's be fair. The term "greatest generation," of which it's usually applied to the World War II generation, was coined by Tom Brokaw. Why the heck do we listen to somebody like Tom Brokaw anyway? All right, it's some hack from a big television network. There's no reason to listen to Tom Brokaw. I'm not even going to get into that. But what I am going to get into is why the greatest generation is not that great. First and foremost, the most obvious is that they kind of started our problems by begetting the baby boomer generation. The baby boomers didn't come out of a vacuum. They didn't just show up. They weren't, like, delivered by an evil stork, you know, from some different planet hosted by Satan. No, they were raised poorly by a generation that came back from the beaches of Normandy, had a bunch of children, you know, hence the baby boom, didn't raise any of them, let them do whatever the heck they want, let them smoke pot, go to college, do Woodstock, and then, you know, the rest is history. Every subsequent generation's been unequivocally a disaster. But it goes even deeper than that. Because I think, you know, perhaps a few people have put together or they've surmised that, yeah, the greatest generation, they were pretty good, but you hit about 1950 or so, they seem to have fallen asleep and got fat and happy with retirement. And yeah, they didn't do much with the boomers. But hey, you know, come on. They still won World War II. They won the super doop de doop war, the sacred one that nobody should ever question. Well, first off, I, I could do a whole podcast on why World War II is bullcrap. I could spend a whole bunch of time on why FDR baited us to go into the damn thing, and it didn't take us to beat the Nazis for the Nazis to basically beat themselves. But I don't want to digress too much. I could make a different episode of that, and I think I will, actually. I'm going to do one on that later. I want to tell you one of the other more important reasons as to why the greatest generation is very problematic, and they probably started most of the problems we have here. I've managed to come across some pretty good information off of uh, lourockwell.com. That's the best website in the world. Everybody should be going there every day. There's so many great columnists, Lou Rockwell, and of course, you know, a whole bunch of other folks. There's also a fellow on there by the name of Lawrence Vance, and I'm going to give him credit to most of what I'm going to say today. Because he wrote a couple of really good articles on why the greatest generation is incredibly overrated, and it's because they're, well, basically sex fiends. He references a couple of research books that confirm all this, that you know, deep, did a deep dive into these topics. So he wrote two articles. One of them's The Greatest Generation of Whoremongers, and the other is The Greatest Generation of Rapists. So that's where we're going with this, folks. All this sexual degeneracy that we've experienced and that the baby boomers put on steroids, it actually probably started with the, the so-called greatest generation. Now, the first of Lawrence's articles I want to look at the one about the whoremongers, he delves into this book called What Soldiers Do, Sex and the American G.I. in World War II France. This is a book by Mary Louise Roberts. So here we talk about, or she talks about, that wonderful hollowed experience in Normandy and you know what it, what it was actually like once the troops got there and what they did with the local women. Here's how she puts it, and I quote, With very few exceptions, the G.I.s had no emotional attachment to the French people or the cause of their freedom. This book presents G.I. sexual conduct as neither innocent of power nor unimportant, unimportant in effect. And she lists a whole bunch of things. There's a whole bunch of bullet points here that he highlighted 
of just different habits that they had once they went into places like Paris. What they did and what, you know, GIs tend to do every time they go anywhere when they're deployed in these situations. This is not completely uncommon. There's several different bullet points here, and these are quotes as well. The GIs proposition women right in front of their husbands or boyfriends. The local girls flock to the large camps north of town where the American soldier was, quote, further quoted, jumping on, even raping anyone, anything which fell under, I won't read the rest, it's pretty bad. <laughs> Uh, let's see. During their time in France, the GIs bought an extraordinary amount of sex. Cooperation with GIs and prostitutes ensured a, set, a steady supply of sex. An estimated dozen divisions started their own brothels. Soon after D-Day, military officers realized that they could not control GI sexual activity in France. Sexual relations, because unrestricted in public, sexual intercourse was performed in broad daylight before the eyes of civilians, including children. The warm weather, again, this is France, probably southern France, the warm weather facilitated outdoor sex. U.S. officers tried to contain the damage to their reputation by scapegoating black GIs and proclaiming rape to be a black crime. Prostitutes were considered the French commodity par excellence. In the mind of a GI, a prostitute differed little from a cigarette saving the price on the black market. So, again, if you believe her account, and I'm not saying you have to, but there's one account of, hey, maybe our soldiers and sailors are not automatically saints. <laughs> but this is the stuff you never hear about in regards to the older generations. We always assume that everything in terms of sexual depravity began at 1969 in Woodstock. Now, this, if this is true, you know, we had this problem way back when. All right, and again, I'm going to go look at this other article. This is the one where, he, and then here he looks at the book. And this one is titled, Taking Leave, Taking Liberties, American Troops on the World War II Home Front. It's by Aaron Hiltner. And here, once again, uh, as uh, Lawrence Vance is reviewing this, he breaks down various quotes and kind of puts them together. So in this one section, he's got a lot of interesting highlights. It says, from Hil Hiltner, quote, most servicemen on leave gravitated towards three things on hitting port. Women, alcohol, and brawling. Civilians were expected to provide them all. All thoughts came back to women, women, and women, and more women. And liquor. And sallying forth in search of gin and sin. The Army and Navy set up policies that discouraged court-martials while giving tacit approval of criminal behavior in Liberty Ports. Troops arrived in Liberty Ports ready to get drunk, exacerbating already growing problems of sexual assault, prostitution, and vandalism. Men often hit the bars near the dockyards before moving on to the red-light districts and honky-tonks. Women often found little recourse for this chronic pattern of harassment, threat, assault, and rape. Many war workers, and I hear talking about the women on the other side, many war workers ceased opportunities to transgress sexual boundaries and enjoyed the change to date multiple men. So, unfortunately, as they went over to France or we went to places like that, yeah, the folks overseas were sometimes all too willing to accommodate this bad behavior. Just goes to show it's not exclusively an American problem by any stretch of the imagination. And in both of these books that Lawrence Vance reviews, they both point to the same theme that this was ubiquitous. It happened stateside. It happened in France. It happened in Okinawa, you know, during the Korean War. How many movies have you seen, too? You, once you got to the Vietnam era, they started making movies about it. Then everybody had to accept that, hey, that's kind of just how GIs are. That's what happens when you take guys and you put them in unnatural situations 6,000 miles away or something for six months at a time. Yeah, they start raping and pillaging, basically. It's as old as the hill. It goes back to Genghis Khan. What we've done in America is that we have idolized particular segments of our history and we completely ignored any possibility of wrongdoing. We've canonized certain age cohorts. Now, to be sure, and I've done this too, we bash the heck out of folks like the baby boomers, uh, the millennials especially, Gen X to a lesser extent, but then we give a total carte blanche, a total pass to this World War II generation. Whereas, you know, as we can see from some of these historical authors, assuming their research is good, I picked a couple of them, that way it's, you know, not just all dependent on one. According to these authors, it, it might have been quite the opposite of sainthood. And as you've heard me say many times on this show, our society 
Western civilization has been in an enormous decline ever since about the World War II era where we got really lazy and happy with ourselves and divorced ourselves from all manners of difficulty, uh, any sort of uh, semblance of the old church militant, you know, the hard, difficult, rigorous approach to religion and morals. I think this sort of explains it. If this was what the World War II generation was really like, you know, a bunch of public degenerates, then I hate to say none of this is terribly surprising. And it also fits pretty well with Our Lady of Fatima's message. Remember, she, re she predicted World War II. A lot of people remember that. But what was something else she went into in heavy detail? Well, she talked about sins of the flesh landing souls into hell. She spoke a lot about immodest fashions. And then again, I've, I've reviewed this a little bit. I talk about it on Ditch the State, Love Holy Church, my blog. You should check that out. You know, the Fatima message was not a one and done. It wasn't just about communism in Russia either. I've got plenty to say about Russia, and Russia is still bad. But the finger needs to be pointed, as I believe Our Lady was, was doing, at the rest of the world as well. And it in particular, Western civilization. And look, you know what? I, I, I said I wasn't going to make this an episode about World War II being bogus or anything like that. But, you know, on second thought, why not? Let's at least acknowledge the basics of this. Because, it, it, I don't know, they, they're, if there was a bad war, if we can identify that it was a bad war, and therefore probably a bad spirit, an evil spirit attached to the whole damn thing, it shouldn't surprise us that our troops unfortunately may have been corrupted by that and it may have even happened on the home front there's the other thing i think we get wrong is like well we assume there's so much sacrifice and hard work and all that on the home front in order to pave the way for that war to take place while the you know the men were overseas a lot of the men didn't go overseas they stayed home and they looted and polluted the cities the bo uh, two books go into that as well but let's let's take just a second about world war ii this is a conflict where as i've mentioned before we became the only country in the history of the world, and ever since, to have dropped two nuclear bombs. Nobody else has dropped one. We took two and flung them at Japan. After the war was pretty much damn well over. And people like to debate and banter back and forth. Oh, well, we needed to do it to end the war. We need to do it. Blah, 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 blah. We had already won the war. We firebombed Tokyo. We didn't need to drop nuclear bombs on two cities. And to show you how bizarre that was, it was committed by a president, Harry Truman, who while he was vice president and these bombs were you know, tested in that Manhattan project, he wasn't even present there. Who knows how much he even knew about what he was doing. Now, I'm willing to bet FDR knew quite a bit. In fact, heck, let's talk about FDR. There's a guy who before becoming president, I think most people or at least a few people probably know he was governor of New York. A lot of people have heard of that, but he was also Secretary of the Navy at one point, which means, well, what does a Secretary of, a Na of the Navy do? All things considered, he should probably know where the boats are around the world, our boats, the military ones, the dreadnoughts and you know, the submarines, nuclear and otherwise. He would be more or less the expert on that. So I think it only goes to reason that he would also know what not to do with them and how to stay away from baiting our enemies, our potential enemies, into conflict. And he did exactly the opposite when he became president. He took all our boats, parked them out on Pearl Harbor, and then we're all supposed to be surprised when the Japanese got a little up in arms about it. Well, yeah, we took our boats, half of them, whatever it was, I can't remember. It's kind of a lot. It was, it was enough for it to appear to be aggressive. And we put them like, right across the pond from, from Japan whereas we could have probably left them at San Diego or any number of places. Long story short, he baited them into the war because he wanted in, because he wanted to get into the European conflict. For the same reason, we get into almost all the conflicts since then, because the war machine, financed and credited by the central banking system in this country, loves conflict, loves war because they make money off of it. Nowadays, it's your Boeings and McDonald, uh, McDonald Douglases and, you know, the, the uh, Halliburton and those types. Back then, it was your steel makers and whoever made the submarines and, air, and, and early aircraft. These are scams. Even World War II, it wasn't about running over and saving any Jews. It's never been about that. You can go back and look at what, you know, look at what their early motivations were. Look at what the newspapers are talking about. So you had a monster of a president, you had a lot of bad presidents during that time period, in the middle of the century, who put us in a bad conflict, 
And our guys, our culture, not surprisingly, got corrupted by it. That's my take on it. When you got bad government, bad leadership, bad wars, it's going to affect the culture. Now, as I say all this, some people are going to take the wrong message from it and assume that, that I conclude that all the people who sacrificed and worked hard, because there were many, during World War II, during that whole conflict, were all a bunch of rapists. I'm not saying that. I'm saying, based on some evidence that we got in this glorious, awful era of censorship we have, and we've had it a while, actually, there are some sources we have that suggest that these were not angels back in the day. In fact, Lawrence Vance, I think he concludes it pretty well in one of his articles. He says, quote, U.S. soldiers in World War II were heroic, they were brave, they were altruistic, but they were also the greatest generation of fornicators and carousers. Uh, the book Taking Leave, Taking Liberties makes this perfectly clear, but also exposes the negative effects of the militarization of society. And that's exactly it. When you keep lobbing us into war after war after war, World War I, World War II, Korean conflict, Vietnam, it's more obvious than pronounced with the later generations. I, I won't dispute that. But there's pretty good evidence it happened even in the middle of the 20th century with World War II. In fact, there's probably good evidence that it was the case in World War I as well. However, you know, it, it, that's over 100 years from now and our press wasn't as sophisticated as it is even in just the last several decades. So keep this in mind. I'm not calling everybody's grandpa or great-grandpa a, a, a fornicator or a rapist. It's not that simple. We're painting broad strokes here. We're dealing with macros and averages. I just want us to remember that we should not be lionizing any particular age, court, or generation. Let's dial it back a little bit, look at it a little more realistically, because we're not zombies. And if we want to fix some of our problems, it really helps to know where some of the root causes came from, or at least when they started. That's all I got, folks. As usual, I want you to check out my book, Caesar Vacantism, available on Amazon before they get rid of all conservative libertarian books. Check out my blog, Ditch the State Love Holy Church.com, and subscribe. Please subscribe. Thank you. Have a good one. Deus Volt. Cue the music.